Hello, everyone, and uh, I wanted to welcome you to Attuning to the Voice of Mother Earth, How to Hear Her and Follow Her Call Global Conference, where through inspiring interviews, we're invited to explore real actions we can take as individuals to deepen our connection to Mother Earth, while at the same time discovering a way to our truer selves. My name is Maya Zaharov, and I'm a creator of Attuning to the Voice of Mother Earth Summit and the founder of Sisters Wellspring. And I just wanted to extend a warm welcome to all of you and to thank you for taking your time to be here with us. Um, today, we are joined by Cater Brown. Welcome, Cater. Thank you, Maya. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm super happy to have you with us. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, read um, Cater's bio as, as a way of introduction, and then uh, we'll move forward. Cater is an internationally acclaimed ceremonialist and cowrie shell diviner, a healer, intuitive, and teacher of psychological and spiritual awareness with over 35 years of professional experience. Cater has developed an effective and unique approach to emotional and spiritual healing by braiding together his depth of clinical knowledge with more nature-based indigenous wisdom teachings and ritual healing methods from around the world. Cater is the founder and director of Rites of Passage Council, an organization offering nature-based ceremonial encampments and training programs. Cater is known for his ability to blend many creative and expressive forms of depth psychology with more ancient wisdoms of healing through vision quest ceremonies, sweat lodge ceremonies, rites of passage experiences, and personalized ceremonies and rituals. Cater lives in the highlands of Western North Carolina in Asheville. And uh, you can find him on www.caterbrown.com or ritesofpassagecouncil.org. And um, I just wanted to read what um, Malidoma Same has uh, said about Cater. I have known Cater for a long time as a man of spirit with remarkable devotion to healing. He tends to his duty with royalty and ferocious commitment. As a man who hears the call of earth and nature, Cater extends his hand to those in quest of change and transformation and is always willing to lead them into and guide them through a deep sense of communion with themselves. Having worked with him in a number of rituals and ceremonies, and watched carefully the way he gives himself to spirit, I have come to respect his priestly devotion to the sacred in nature and in every human. His work deserves respect and reverence. So that is uh, a wonderful quote um, or a testimonial of Meliloma Same. And um, Akira, I just want to turn it over to you and uh, we'll begin. Thank you, Maya. And welcome, everyone. It's great to be here with you uh, when you eventually get to see this. Um, I'd like to begin with an invocation, uh, in part uh, as a way of honoring and gratitude, and in part to help me give, give me some adequate, adequate words to say. Um, so I will invite you into this invocation by closing your eyes and imagining one of your favorite places in nature. And I'm gonna send my spirit there uh, for this invocation so I can focus. And I want you to imagine yourself standing in that place in nature on a spring morning at sunrise facing the sun. And we'll start there. So create a great spirit with humble hearts, with grateful hearts and clear hearts. We call upon you this day and welcome this new day. Help us to listen deeply to the voices of the earth and of nature in a way that guides our path forward, helps us navigate this road of difficulty and challenge at times. And now we turn toward the east and face the rising sun, the place of new beginnings and sunrise, place of fresh new starts, place of eagle and condor, and seeing things for the first time every time. 
the way we can look in the mirror and see ourselves as if we have never seen ourselves before or look into the eyes of our children, our parents, our lovers, our friends with new eyes, dropping the old stories and seeing for the first time that mystery that lives within each one of us. We call on that good medicine from the East to bring in clarity and inspiration and connection and joy. We call on hummingbird. And we offer a bit of cornmeal to this sunrise and we feel its warmth and we feel its invitation to this new day. Welcome spirits of the East. We thank you for awakening within each one of us that bone memory where you live. Uh -oh. And now take a quarter turn to the right in this place in nature and face south. Standing in the noonday sun, the season of summer, the place of manifesting energy. And we call on the good medicine of the south and of summer to teach us of courage and how to stand in our truth, even if we're the only one standing there. They teach us of impeccability and integrity, that place where our words, our thoughts, our actions, and our feelings are exactly the same. And they teach us of creativity and remind us to dance, to move our bodies. We call upon those warm breezes of the South the cougar, the jumping mouse and rattlesnake, and all that good medicine of the South. Remind us of creativity and laughter and playfulness and innocence. We ask that you awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live. With much gratitude, we welcome you, I hope. And now we quarter turn again to the right and we face west, turning into the setting sun, into the autumn leaves, bright colors overhead and on the ground, into the element of water and healing and reconciliation and forgiveness, and turning inward the way nature turns inward in the autumn, sap receding on the vines, turning into the great harvest and notice how we allow ourselves to drink in nourishment, take in support, receive the harvest and share the harvest with others. We call on bear, jaguar and bat and all those ones that teach us how to see in the dark and remind us of that light and that wisdom and how to go into the dark and sit in stillness and deep listening. With much gratitude to the medicine of the West, we welcome you to this circle and ask that you awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live. Uh -oh. And now we quarter turn to the North. We face the sacred mountain, the spirit of winter, the storytellers, the wisdom keepers, the elders, the grandmothers and grandfathers of the North. And we thank elk for teaching us how to go the long and steady distance. And we thank bison for teaching us of the giveaway of prayerfulness and abundance. And we call upon the spirit of the winter to remind us how to let go deeply, to, to surrender to something much greater than ourselves to that wisdom that moves through nature and through the spirit of all things. That place where we know how to surrender so deeply that spring simply shows up because we let go enough and for no other reason. So we call upon the good medicine of the North. And we ask that you awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live. 
in the lands of our ancestors. With much gratitude, I hope. And now standing in that place in nature, imagine yourself standing there at night, looking up at the stars. And we call upon the great above, Sky Nation, Grandmother Moon and Grandfather Sun, our star sisters and brothers and others. And Grandmother Moon, we thank you for teaching us how to step into the shadow and bring those things that we sometimes hold in shadow into the light over and over again. Shadow into light. Being able to talk about those things that are sometimes difficult to talk about with our friends and our loved ones and bring them into the light. Grandfather, son, we thank you for showing up every day, even when it's challenging and difficult teaching us how to do what needs to be done for our children and our elders. Grandfather, son, we thank you for teaching us about falling down seven times and getting up eight, always eight. And to our star sisters and brothers and others and other planetary homes and bright lights, we thank you for shining down your light upon us and reminding us too that we can shine as a beacon of light by the way we live our lives so that you can see us out there. Much gratitude, we acknowledge the Sky Nation, the great above, and ask that you awaken within each one of us that stardust, that bone memory where you live as well. Much gratitude, aho. And now we reach down touch the earth, kneel on the earth, feel the ground beneath our hands and our feet, feel the soil and the soul of Gaia. And we offer gratitude. Gratitude for home and belonging and place. Gratitude for connection and restoration. Gratitude for your teachings of balance and abundance and reminding us that scarcity is only an illusion that is brought about by living out of balance with you. We thank you for fiery cores and crystal caves and offering your continued abundance to your children. May we learn more deeply how to listen to you, how to walk on, upon you with gratitude and humbleness. And we ask that you awaken within each one of us that same soil and soul that lives deep within our bone memory, like it did in the lands of our ancient ancestors. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Aho. and to the lands of our ancestors, our ancient ancestors who lived closely to the land, to nature, who sourced their sense of relatedness from all things around them, from the seasons. We thank you for your laughter and we thank you for your teardrops. We thank you for leaving your footprints and your heartbeats in the ground so that we may dig them up one day and remember who we are and how to walk upon this earth. We thank you for your stories and for dreaming us into this place at this time in creation so that we may dream forth our stories and learn to redream a new earth by attuning ourselves to that earth the way that you were. We also reach out to our distant ancestors in front of us to our great, great, great grandchildren. And we thank you for watching to see how we live our lives in these challenging times so you will know what to do when you get here. We thank you for that trust and that accountability. And may the way in which we live our lives be a blessing for you when you arrive here. With much gratitude. We acknowledge you and welcome you. Aho. And now we turn our attention to the land around us, to nature itself, to the spirit of the mountain that we live closest to or were born next to, 
to the spirit of the largest body of water that we live closest to or were born in relationship with. We offer our gratitude to the swimmers in the water, the crawlers in the earth and on the earth, the plant medicine people, Mm, the tall standing people, the stone people, the four-legged people, the two-legged people, and the winged, winged people. And we thank you for all of creation for nature, helping us remember that we too belong in the same circle of life as you. Help us finding our way back home to that connection, back home to that place. With much gratitude, we acknowledge you. And ask that you help in awakening with each one of us that bone memory where you live. No hope. And we call upon the great council that sits on the other side of our fire, stirring the coals with their fire and keeping them hot. And we thank that great council for standing by us for believing in us, even when we falter and fail to sometimes believe in ourselves. We thank you for keeping those fires going on that side. And the may, may the way in which we keep the fires burning on this side be a blessing to all our people, human and non-human peoples. With much gratitude. Aho, Matakwiasin. Taking a deep breath, and then you're bringing yourself back to our conversation here. And we'll see see where we go. Thank you, Cater. That was such a treat, really. I was just lamenting this morning that I I didn't have time um, today for my usual practice because um, the routines, my routines also have been interrupted. I just want to say as a side note, we're recording this on April the 7th. So we're in the midst of a global pandemic. So our routines have been interrupted. My routine, because I used to go for a walk in the, in the forest nearby. So, and now it's closed because it's a state forest. So, I was thinking I need to come up with something more localized, <laughs> maybe in my house, but and this is just so perfect. Thank you so, so much from the bottom of my heart. It really helped me. Mm, you're quite welcome. It's a, it's a simple way of bringing in the day that can be done uh, every day. If you make a circle, you can, if you have stones or any way of creating a circle and orienting yourself to the directions in the season, and then begin each day or go to bed each night by just walking that circle, putting on a, a song that's meaningful or, or just in silence, walk to each season, each direction and offer some gratitude and, uh, and make it a practice. So it's very, it can be very simplified um, if we are not able to get out in nature these days and, and do that. Or to send your spirit like we just did to, to yeah. close your eyes and send your spirit to that favorite place in nature and do ceremony while you're there in that form. It's yeah, a good way. Absolutely, very helpful. It's just a way of creating new new routines, new habits. I think this, mm -hmm. this is what we're asked to do. So this is what I need to be doing. So I just um, wanted to uh, let everyone know that uh, the topic of your talk today is soil and soul, listening to the lands of our ancient ancestors. And uh, I just um, wanted to ask you, first of all, it's a wonderful topic. When I read it first, I was like, wow, I can't, I'm just enchanted. I can't wait to go, to go in there. So I wanted to ask you, uh, what are some stories of us getting lost and disconnected from the earth wisdom? And how do we find our way back into a thriving relationship with her? Well, of course, there are many stories about how we veered off course. Um, one of my, my favorite ones that stuck with me was a story I heard from, uh, her name is Wabin Wind. She was the daughter of Sun Bear. Um, and some folks may have heard of Sun Bear and his writings. 
some years ago. And she tells the story um, back before uh, we became uh, planters and growers, when we were much more nomadic, is that we lived in the flow of, of life and, and um, the hunting and gathering stage. And, and many stories begin that way. They go back to that time um, when one had to be in more uh, relationship with nature in, in a much more uh, fluid way. And then in, in her story, she said that there was a time 8,000 to 15,000 years ago that there was a shift in the polar fields, maybe like we're experiencing now. Um, and so the hunting and gathering cultures uh, began to uh, lose the ability to, to move about in the same way. And so they began to be still and they planted themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and in doing so, began to plant. And you can see this shift in, in different spiritual traditions where they move from a more earth-centered uh, spiritual belief systems to then it becomes solar focused and, and sun-centered. And so we move from, uh, uh, or places where they maintain kind of a balance, like in Celtic, spirit, Celtic Christianity, it's this weird blending of both earth-based and sun-based spiritual traditions. Uh, so the focus then moved away from earth and toward the heavens and sky and, and our spiritual belief systems became more sky or sun oriented. Um, with that um, shift, and we can see that even in, even in some of the Old Testament stories of, of Cain and Abel, if some, some of them know those stories where uh, one brother represents the earth tradition and one brother represents the, uh, the, the new, newer evolving tradition um, and they battle. And so these, these ancient stories uh, also reflect these uh, historical changes. Um, so this happens. And then um, once you start planting and growing, um, then you set yourself in opposition to everything else that wants what you're planting and growing. So all of a sudden um, you, you create a section of land that you plant something and um, you bring that land under cultivation and then you start protecting that land. And as we know in, in, uh, uh, in many teachings, anytime you bring Anytime you increase the food resources of any species, the population of that species increases. Therefore, you have to bring more land under cultivation and on and on it goes. Um, and therefore, you're in opposition with everything that wants it. The, here's an interesting twist that I hadn't heard until, uh, until I learned it from this, this native elder. She said, the other thing that happened was this idea of ownership. And we didn't really own, you can't own the land. You can't own the sky, the stars, the trees, the waters. Um, and you can't own each other. Um, and in her telling, she says that the, uh, originally that w there was not knowledge of how one became pregnant and where, how children came into this world, but that the medicine women uh, figured this out basically. And held that knowledge of, of how this happens. That originally it was considered that if one uh, man's totem overcame the woman's totem animal, that somehow there was this creation of a child. And, um, and so the child then would became part of the village um, and was held by the village. Um, once that knowledge got out, then all of a sudden this tension between not only between the genders, um, but the idea that one of the uh, original concepts of ownership was then focused on the woman's womb. And this disconnection that's slowly happening with, with earth. Um, and then everything else uh, kind of graduating from that story are systems of medicine and philosophy and psychology and religion are forming under a time where uh, humans begin to split from nature. 
Um, and so all of these forms or constructs of understanding are formed after the split um, between humans and nature. And so now we're in a time uh, where that split can no longer maintain itself. And as, uh, as Chief Seattle said in, in his letter to the president, you can't do one thing to the web of life without harming yourself. Um, and so when we look at this pandemic time we're in, um, I'm reminded of a, uh, a phrase my, one of my, my Cherokee teacher, Will Rockingbear, used to share with me when he would use the term red dogs. He said, oh, this is a red dog. Um, and a red dog is, is a reference to that which is a difficult teacher, um, but a teacher nonetheless. And so if we look at this, this virus that we're in, this challenging time of global change and threshold that we're in, we could say this is a difficult teacher. This is a red dog that, that is, uh, we have brought into relationship with ourselves. And what is it to, here to teach us? Um, and, and certainly to uh, how, we, how we deal with death um, and the fears of death. You know, as we're all sequestered in our homes right now and, um, and, and you know, trying to protect ourselves or protect our elders. Um, and so how do we look in the eyes of death as an ally too? Um, and so these are all teachings that come from nature. And um, many, many rituals and ceremonies of how to connect with nature and listen more deeply that we, that we can talk about in time here. Um, but uh, the, the thing about eradicating anything or changing anything that I learned um, uh, from Rocking Bear was that first we have to ask the question, what is the teaching that is being offered here and have we learned that teaching before we set about getting rid of it and, and, or extinguishing it? Um, so that we can use that teaching as we walk forward. Um, and so I think that's, those are things that we're, that are being asked of us, in my opinion. What is it that, what are the teachings that are going to come out of this time we're in? Um, and how do we use this forced uh, solitude the way our ancient ancestors would have gone into solitude, into nature, into fasting, into prayer? to seek guidance um, and listen, you know, listen to the wind, to the water, to the mountain spirit, and, and then return to their people with, with something they have heard, with a new song, uh, some, something that, some vision that will enable their people to live forward. Um, so those are some initial thoughts, not only on kind of how we got here, but, um, how we how we how we navigate forward is the is the bigger question. Yeah, it's it, it's wonderful listening to you. Really, I I uh, I I loved everything I've heard and and how how I guess most of the stories that we've been taught, especially the, I guess in the West, you know, are coming from the perspective of already being isolated from nature. I haven't, I haven't thought about it, but yeah, we're always kind of like looking to the heavens, you know, to God and uh, monotheistic God, which is, which is fine. But as long as we don't forget kind of where we came from or what we're standing on, and where we're getting all our nourishment. So. That's... Yeah. It's, it's, it's like the heavens and creation above is all part of nature too. Exactly. Um, it's more like Gaia, Pachimama, planet Earth is our particular mother in this cosmos. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, as, a, as a good parent will we'll teach us of balance and, and teach us of, of these things if we listen. Exactly. Um, and so it, there, there's one... Uh, one indigenous teaching that's become lost to a great degree um, that has to do with the this understanding of the lands of our ancient ancestors and that the or the stories in the stones or led you know stories in the land mm -hmm. um, 
and that one could listen deeply to the land um, and and hear, not with not with our normal hearing, but with maybe the ears of our heart or the ears of inspiration, um, uh, some other information. And so this um, one of the ancient practices of rites of passage, uh, initiations of uh, going into nature under the guidance of an elder um, and being prepared to go out for a period of time. And that period of time might vary depending on a culture uh, to fast, to uh, offer gratitude and prayer um, in, in nature alone and seek vision you know, to, to remember. And there's a teaching I've learned um, some years ago, I worked at a uh, uh, re wilderness recovery center. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I was working with um, a young man from uh, South Africa who grew up there until he was eight, and then was taken from there and plopped down in Washington, DC. And um, so you can see where the you know there's already trouble in the in the in the uh, on the radar now. Um, so his world of you know being in a village at eight now being in Washington D.C. dramatically changed uh, the course of of where he how he would have lived. Um, and the reason he was sitting in front of me at a wilderness recovery center is because he had gone through the route of self-initiation um, drugs gangs all this uh, modern day society of how one initiates themselves in the inner cities um, and so the 17 year old kid and i were sitting together and having known a little bit of something about his tribe that he grew up in i said uh, do you have a different name and he thought and he kind of looked at me odd and he said yeah I said, will you write it down for me? And so he got a piece of paper and wrote down this long name, kind of covered the page across with this long name in his, in his native, native language. And I said, read that for me. And what he read were elements and features in the landscape and aspects of nature that were imprinted in this name. And, he, and then he, after writing it, and he told me what it said. And then he stopped and he looked tearful for a moment. And he said, uh, looked up and he said, you know, my grandmother, we call her Goji, that was the word. Uh, before I left, she told me, she said, follow your name. Follow your name. Because in this name, the, these elements and these features of the landscape and these, these animals, it was a, it was a map. Exactly. for where he is headed and so when she said follow your name she meant stay connected stay connected to what i see in you as an elder that is your medicine of where you're headed and um so this this way of relationship with nature was so embedded or as uh, one time i asked melodoma another one of my teachers melodoma i said melodoma how do the people in your village, and this is before I went with him to Africa, I said, how do the people in your village understand their, their connection to nature? Mm -hmm. And he, he looked up, he laughed, and he said, oh, you can't ask that kind of question. He said, you can't ask somebody how they're connected to something that they've never been disconnected from. Exactly. It would be like if I said to you, how, do you, how are you connected to your skin? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what kind of question is that? <laughs> it, 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 to talk about connection, one has to experience disconnection. Sure. Um, so it's like a, it's an odd thing to consider if you're so connected uh, mm -hmm. to the water that runs by your village or the the trees, uh, and they're not just uh, trees; they're 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 beings. They're you have relationship with them, each one. Mm -hmm. um, so this this way of connecting in a way that our ancient ancestors. Uh, new and that's that's if you walked in behind your lineage if if we could turn and walk down your lineage maya down you know those lines of lineage behind you we would eventually arrive 
uh, no matter where on the planet we ended up in these ancient practices, in these ancient ways of understanding um, that connected people with nature. Yes. yes. Absolutely. So I guess, so how, how do we, in, in your perspective, how do we attune ourselves to a deeper way of listening to the voice of the earth? Um, well, first, uh, uh, notice what we're listening to, you know, take a moment and notice what, what it is we're listening to. And, um, as they say, do, do, when, when you're in the company, when you're sitting in silence in your own company, or you're sitting by yourself in silence, do you like the company you keep? Um, or as a, uh, uh, an author from a long time ago, Og Mandino, once said, if I said to you all of the things that you say to yourself about yourself in your head, would we be friends? <laughs> and most people, when I say that to most people, they think, mm, maybe not, maybe we wouldn't be friends. Said, well, that's where we need to start. Yeah. Or as my uh, Will Rocking Bear said one time, when, when somebody said to him, he said, you know, they said, what do we do about all this violence in the world and turmoil in the world? And, and hatred in the world and he paused for me and said you have to stop the violence and then he stopped and then he said and I'm talking about the violence we tend to do to ourselves in our own heads we have to start there mm -hmm. and so when I say how do we attune ourselves to the deeper wisdom to the voice of nature of, of, of earth first notice what it is we are listening to to still ourselves and just start noticing the, the, the inner dialogue because that's the, the first, uh, first area of change. The first area of revolution <laughs> is in our own heads. <laughs> um, and to notice that those, uh, where our thoughts go when they go unattended. Um, it's, it's like our, our uh, with, with ritual and ceremony, uh, the best definition of ritual that I like is that it's nonsense. And so I look at me, what do you mean ritual is nonsense? I said, well, it is not for your mind to be making sense of when you're in it. When you're in it, you're, you're viscerally alive and you're paying attention and you're engaged in the moment with what you notice and what actions you're guided to take. And you're responding in relationship with the moment. Um, Next week, when you think about the ritual, that's when your mind will get involved. <laughs> um, but otherwise, ritual should be nonsense. And, and that's another way of saying, how do we quiet uh, the mind? And so whether it's yoga or meditation um, or focusing our attention uh, with a song that we like or a prayer or a gratitude. Um, that will help at least direct our thoughts. If we can't quiet them, at least we can direct them. And I tell people the easiest way to shift your thinking. Well, let's start with the hardest way. Uh, somebody said, well, I don't feel good. I don't, um, it's the hardest thing to do is to shift a feeling with another feeling. And that's what most people try to do is we wait for our feelings to change. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's a long wait sometimes. The next hardest thing is to shift our feelings or thoughts with other thoughts. It's like, well, I'll just have a different thought and that'll change my feelings. It's like, well, that's another hard way. The quickest way to shift your thoughts and feelings is with an action. An action uh, of compassion, mm -hmm. an action of love, particularly if it's anonymous. Uh, so that when you go drop uh, a pebble of compassion in somebody's life mm -hmm. you want to turn and walk away before they can make it about you yeah um with a thank you because the moment you hear thank you you have to start responding um and another teaching i learned about how to drop these little pebbles of compassion in places and turn and walk away before it can be focused back on us uh, as the one who left it there mm -hmm. And they can be simple gestures, but these ways, what they'll do is they'll dis disengage our habitual mind and thinking. 
and, and orient us to present moment, which I call ritual consciousness. And so finding ways to quiet the mind is the first part of uh, this. The, the second part would then be the listening. So um, whether you can do it physically to go into nature, or if you can't do it physically uh, from your apartment, from your home, or you're in, in the city, even right now in these times, wherever you happen to be, um, to close your eyes and what I call send your spirit to that place. Uh, in nature and um, in the protocols of relationship it's it's uh, connecting with being able to hear someone we have to be in relationship so that if we went if we are able to go to say our go to our great great grandparents grandmother's home we might go and we take a gift say hey, grandmother I want to come sit with you today and I brought you this, this thing that you really like and I just want to offer it to you and, and spend some time with you. So when you go to that place in nature, take a gift, mm -hmm. uh, take some water for a thirsty plant or, or take some uh, a traditional offering. I'll take some milk and honey to the river, to flowing water is a way of offering milk and honey. Um, a little sesame seed uh, or maybe something of my ancestors that they liked was Irish brown bread. I might take a bit of that, mm -hmm. especially if I'm engaging ancestors. Um, like for my mom and dad who are both crossed over, uh, the thing that for the take are dove, dove chocolates and these Hershey's chocolate kisses, dad and mom. And so whenever I go to have a conversation with them, I, I take these, <laughs> maybe a bit of uh, good Scotch whiskey pour it on the ground and mm -hmm. so having an offering you know it's it's about relationship to so make an offering um, in this place in nature either uh remotely when i say to do this in in, in spirit to, mm -hmm. to see yourself to send your spirit there um to make the offering and then say why you have come you know if you're talking to a 800 year old cedar if you happen to live up in the uh an Olympic Peninsula of this country, you could do that. Or if you're talking to a creek that happens to run near your house, mm -hmm. um, you make an offering and, and you say, you know, grandmother, grandfather, you know, I've, uh, um, we're in this challenging time right now. And um, we're facing this global pandemic or I'm facing whatever I'm, I'm, you know, I'm at home crazy about to pull my hair out with the kids, don't know what to do. <laughs> whatever whatever's real to you and alive um don't sugarcoat it by thinking you have to have clever words mm -hmm. I, always, I always learned that the ancestors are not interested in in eloquy they're mm -hmm. interested in heart and so if all you can do is offer tears and snot <laughs> that that's good they understand that <laughs> um so to make an offering mm -hmm. and then say why why am i here you know, I've come here because I'm I'm feeling lost. I'm 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 carrying this question. I don't know how to respond with this question. <clears throat> and I've come here with this question. Or maybe you do uh, an hour walk in nature, or a fifteen minute journey where you send your spirit somewhere. And after following these protocols of introduction and offering and request, then you listen and you watch. Um, so I did something like this, uh, uh, last week, the beginning of last week, um, when all of this, uh, stay at home was starting to happen in our area. Um, unfortunately I have some land in the highlands of, of, of Western North Carolina <clears throat> that I can go to. And so I decided I was going to do a, a one day medicine walk. So I went to my land and I began with a threshold ceremony way to mark the beginning. Mm -hmm. Made some offerings, said some prayers, and offered some gratitude, <clears throat> and stepped across that threshold. Uh, simply, uh, it could be a, a line in the sand, literally, or whatever, whatever kind of threshold. And once you step in, then you've, you've, you've activated the awareness and the intention that now I am in uh, the spirit world, now I'm in the, the realm of deep listening. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not in ordinary listening anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm in deep listening across this threshold. And then I just meandered through nature, let my intuition guide me wherever it took me. <clears throat> took me to this, this large rock that was in this meadow and I climbed up on the rock and sat there and I opened this journal that I had that I picked off the book, off the bookshelf. Mm -hmm. And it is a journal that I hadn't written in in like five years. And I opened it to the first page and apparently I only wrote one question. And there was a question in there waiting for me. And it says, what kind of life do you want to live? And I thought, huh, there's, there's a question already waiting in this journal for me. And so I sat with that question and considered these times of challenge that we're in. <clears throat> and then I walked down above the river and paused and, and looking down at the river, I saw some deer crossing the river and starting up the bank where I was standing. So I squatted down low and kind of turned my head away uh, and waited. And they came up the bank about maybe 15 feet behind uh, my left shoulder. And I kind of tilted my head and I looked back over and I counted one, two, three, like six deer walking past me. Mm -hmm. And then the last deer, this male deer that was bringing up the, the end of the, the line, maybe of this little family, stopped and then turned its head and looked directly at me. The rest of them just had walked. And that one didn't. It had stopped and turned and looked at me. And I looked at, at this deer. Um, and we just held each other's gaze for a moment. And then it turned and walked on. And I thought about what are the teachings of deer for these times? And for me, the teachings of deer are about compassion for ourselves, self-compassion for each other. Um, there's an old Seneca story, Seneca uh, Indian story, native story of um, this, this troll that lived under a bridge and, uh, and would not let anyone pass. And so they, the animals got together and decided that they would send a small doe, a, a deer. And, uh, and that it, when it got to the bridge, it had so much love that it just overpowered <laughs> the, the gatekeeper at that bridge and was able to pass. Um, and so I took that teaching from nature. And then I continued on my walk, my medicine walk that day. And I was walking down this trail and I saw this, the, these white bones over to the side under this, I think it was a dogwood tree. Um, and I walked over and it was a, a, a bear skull. And I, and I thought about bear. <clears throat> I thought about what are the teachings of bear for me? Well, bear is about dreaming, deep listening to the dream, um, and about setting goals and visioning. Um, so I thought about, you know, the road ahead that we're traveling and, and what are the, what are we dreaming into our life? And are we intentional with what we are dreaming in? You know, the old ones say, uh, be mindful of your thoughts because those are your prayers. Be mindful of your thoughts because those are your prayers. So this idea of what are we dreaming into our life? And what kind of, what kind of medicine does it bring into these times? So I, I took that teaching from, from Bear. Mm -hmm. um, but those ways of engaging nature, having the luxury to be able to go for a day from sunup to sundown and walk and take notes and, and watch and listen. Um, I always remind people that, that the, the ancestors don't need a lot of time. Mm -hmm. They just need your attention. <laughs> and if you have a whole day, that's great. And if you have uh, 10 minutes, that will work too. If you can distill mm -hmm. and quiet your mind offer the follow those protocols of relationship and and then listen and that's the 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 last part is after the the offering is then listen after you make a request listen mm -hmm. watch pay attention um it could be very subtle it might be the shift of the wind coming out of a different direction mm -hmm. or it could be something you know elaborate like deer or bear um, or it could simply be an ant crawling on the ground Yes. Um, or something in our apartment <laughs> or our home that, or a thought or an inspiration, you know, 
it's uh, once you cross that threshold into deeper listening, then you've attuned yourself to a deeper listening and you pay attention to everything. Everything has medicine. And then at the end of your time, mark crossing back over the threshold. Looks like you offer gratitude. Um, maybe if you work with smudge, you can smudge off and then you step back across the threshold. So if you have to get in your car and drive, you know that stop signs look like this and pedestrians look like that. You're not going to run over things. Um, yeah. Or you simply have a way of marking, now I'm stepping back into uh, consensus or ordinary consciousness so I can navigate my physical world with preparing dinner for the kids or whatever it is I'm going to be doing. So I have this way of marking a threshold, stepping in and marking it and coming out. And it, whether you have a whole day or a, a 15 minute journey in nature that you do internally. Um, yes. It's all, it's all good. Yes. <laughs> These are all wonderful strategies, practices that we can all do. Absolutely. And I think like some of the things you're talking about, mm -hmm. I think we're, I guess intuitively are, are kind of doing them I, it's it's when i was telling you before that i go for a walk in 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 nature in that state forest there's two pine trees as i walk on the path they're almost exactly on either side of the of the path they're right at the beginning mm -hmm. they the, the crowns touch so for me when i go in there like i play around in my head it's like a gateway I go in, I, like I acknowledge it mentally, I go in, I walk around, when I come out to back to the parking lot, I say thank you, I come mm -hmm. out. And this is just something I'm, I've been playing with, it's nothing <laughs> I've heard, you know, and it's almost silly to say it out loud, but now that you've kind of said that, it no. like, makes sense. Yeah, this, this is uh, uh, listening to how you introduced it, I would, when you say that again, just take the word like out of the sentence and say this is a gateway. Exactly. Um, and this threshold uh, would be a place, you know, to, to make a little offering. Um, it, the offering can be something physical. Um, sometimes I, my hair looks in different positions here because often I'll grab a piece of hair and I'll just cut a little piece of with my knife and lay it on the ground as an offering. Um, or if I don't have something physical, um, I may offer a song or a thought or a poem, but a way of acknowledgement. And because you know, when you step between those two trees, it is not the same. It's something not. shifts. So that these these beings, the this is a threshold. Um, and when you walk in nature, um, if you have a chance of doing that, um, sometimes I've given people the the ritual prescription to do a medicine walk like that. And I'll say, uh, when you go into nature. Um, uh, at, at the beginning, I want you to pick up four small stones. Um, and then on your walk, you're going to cross through four different gateways, four different thresholds. And each one may offer a stone, speak a prayer into it, offer a gratitude, and just place it on the ground. You'll know when you get to those thresholds, you'll feel it. You'll know, oh, this is one. And then after you cross through the four, then pause somewhere and, and sit for a while and listen. Um, yeah, it's the and so it, you're, yeah, and, uh, and and so what you're doing, Maya, is you're you're remembering like these practices are ancient. This way of relating is in your bones. Uh, it comes from the lands of your ancestors, and there's something in in you intuitively that knows it. It's not like you're learning; it's is is that you're remembering. And it only feels silly when you hold it up to modern society and, and, or maybe hold it up to the way that I sometimes navigate my world when I'm, you know, going to the, you know, wherever I'm going to Starbucks or something. <laughs> um, but I can have both parts of me. And so this, this way of remembering these ancient ways of being in relationship to, to trust them, you're, uh, this comes from the lands of your ancient grandmothers. They knew this. And um, reminds me of uh, a story a, a man told me one time recently. He was from Ireland, and he was telling me the first time he got to go back and visit his family in Ireland, he was around the age 12, and you know, like most 12-year-olds, he was just 12. 
and he, impatient and, and, his, and he was out on the farm and, his, and he was being impatient and um, not very aware and not very grateful of things. And, his, and, his, and he was there with his grandmother and grandfather. And his grandfather said, come here, son, come with me. And so they got in the got in the car and they drove way out on the on the farm down to this small little spring. Um, and when he got to the spring, there were two buckets sitting by the spring, and they they had walked over, took a little walk, and they walked over there. Pause a minute. I can feel I, I feel into I know where I'm headed with the story. So it has heart. And he took his grandson to the spring in the two buckets and he, and he said, you see up there at the house, and he looked way, way across the farm. He could see the, the window in the kitchen where his grandmother was, the light. And he said, your grandmother walked to this spring every day of her life and got water with these buckets. And he said, and then my grandfather turned and walked away and left me with the buckets. And I got water and I walked. And that walk became sacred. It became holy. Um, and so it's, it's these practices um, that invite, uh, when we approach something with a reverence with heart, it approaches us with reverence and heart. And the simple practice of, of this spring was a place, was a, was a holy spring. It, it was a sacred place made sacred by his grandmother's footsteps. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for him to pick up those buckets, fill them with water and carry them, um, he said he never forgot that. Mm -hmm. um, so the, sometimes I think we get a little bit... Um, we do a little bit of that spiritual bypass when we think that being connected or spiritual has to be this grand thing. And often these things come from long practices of being in relationship with something mm -hmm. um, as simple as getting water from a spring. Um, and relationships don't form like that. You know, they take time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so to say that you, in nature, to say that you truly belong somewhere has less to do with what you can tell me about the place you're in, what you notice about it. And it really, for me, it has more to do with the ones that are in that place and how they notice you. So I have a, in my backyard, when I, if I drink coffee in the backyard, I know that the cardinal and the, um, and the woodpecker that live in, around me like I know the tree they come to and because I go out there and sit frequently they know me mm -hmm. and there's relationship it's like oh it's spring it's it's like oh you're back it's good to see you and and yeah. so there's this way of being in relationship is what gives us uh, uh, an opening mm -hmm. to that connection definitely a sense of belonging yes yeah belonging uh, belonging to and belonging with yes um, is just to give our attention give our attention to the sound of the birds around us and uh, as I remind people a lot of times in the thing in the outings that we do in nature uh, or the encampments mm -hmm. so you know these birds you see um, they're not just passing through they actually live around here <laughs> <laughs> The animals you happen to see in this area, they, they don't have like endless amount of hunting grounds that they travel. They yeah. usually, especially when you see them in the morning or evening, it's because they live here. Mm -hmm. or, the, or, the, or the large black snake you saw down on the trail. It's like they're not from like far off. Yeah. It's, this is where they live. Yeah. And so when you're here enough, when you come here enough, you'll notice mm -hmm. even certain times of day, certain patterns in nature. So again, about relationship yes um is is uh mm -hmm. reconnecting slowing down and reconnecting absolutely and you notice the animals and you learn to respect them and kind of have some reverence for them because you're visiting their home <laughs> <laughs> you're, 
Yeah. And they remind us uh, that we are not separate from the same home. We think we are. And that's part of the big lie, as I once heard it called, that we're not connected, that we're supposed to be separate. And um, one of the, if you sit in nature long enough, and if that nature is your backyard, mm -hmm. or if you go on a walk, if you sit still long enough, um, the animals and the creatures start to come out uh, because they, you start to vibrate internally at a frequency of, of nervous system energy that is more aligned with nature as your, as your nervous system settles down. Mm -hmm. um, then nature begins to recognize you as one of its own. Mm -hmm. And animals come in close. So a bird can show up or a squirrel can run across your lap. Or, I mean, all kinds of things can happen. Um, but what happen, what what I believe enables that to happen is that our when our internal angst settles down and we begin to source our sense of of stillness and calmness from connecting, mm -hmm. then we become more recognizable to the beings of nature, and they come in they like come in closer they're not afraid mm -hmm. It's like when you're, when you're walking in the woods, often the first bird you hear is what's called an alarm bird because it's alerting all the other animals and creatures that somebody's coming. Mm -hmm. But stay there long enough and, and they'll notice you. They'll, uh, you. You'll get that belonging in return. Yeah, wonderful. So true. Thank you, Kater. I, I've, I love listening to, to your wisdom, to all your to everything you've shared really the stories the practices it's and the time <laughs> flew by <laughs> so uh, i just wanted to ask you um as kind of like as a final thought in light of our conversation today can you share with us uh like what can you give us in parting what's you know what do you want to leave us with mm, i'll leave you with a question um Carl Gustav Jung, and more recently, Joanna Macy, uh, used this question. Um, and they said that there is a, a, a question that runs like a thread through everyone's life. And if you can, one great question that runs like a thread through everyone's life. And if you can find that question and follow it, and then your life turns, tends to, move along a certain certain course that's made for you i would say um and it's and, it, and it's questions like that that become more important than answers when we get an answer we tend to stop but when we find a good question one that we can follow and track and and, and into our lives um, then we've really found something and so i'd offer you this simple question in light of all that you have heard in, in this conversation today um, what action are you guided to take and i don't mean with your life that gets way too big and way too like blurry i mean maybe tonight when you go home maybe uh, when you get up tomorrow morning what action are you guided to take this week uh, and you can take that question into nature or you might might draw it forth from our conversation already um, but be careful not to get lost in the search for meaning because uh, meaning is very fluid it's like water mm -hmm. you know if you stop hold water in your hand it's going to keep moving and what it means today will be different than if we watch this five years from now but ask the question what action am i guided to take it's not important that you understand the action. Mm -hmm. it, it's not, and it can be very small. Start close in, and um, only that, the only that following through with the action should be within your value system and within your integrity, and then do it, no matter how small it is. Matter of fact, the smaller the better. And then as you do it, or pay attention to what happens next. This is the key. This is the listening. Because you're lining yourself with a thread, yeah, and and uh, and you're not sure where this thread is going, 
So once you follow the action, even if it's very simple, mm -hmm. pay attention to what happens. Interesting. Uh, and it's not important that you understand the action that you're taking. Interesting. Yeah, it's like traveling in mysteries. Mm -hmm. I was listening to you. I'll share with, with everyone what action I'm going to take. When I was listening to you, I realized but when I go on my walks, yeah, I bring sometimes cornmeal, sometimes just earth that is sacred to me from the other land, you know, mm -hmm. that I felt called to collect. I mean, these are real small, like, things that I did for myself, like rituals, and, and they're not even rituals. I don't even know what to call them. Anyway, it's just something that I, I feel called to do sometimes, which is ah. fine. But when I heard you talk, I've never heard anyone say um, to give milk and honey to the water. And uh, so in my head, I thought, oh, maybe I should, because I, 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 know, I don't make offerings to the water. I pass by a little creek sometimes. I take water from it just to, you know, for mm -hmm. myself to anoint myself just because it feels good but i don't give an offering so when you said that i was like you know what i'll give it milk and honey why have i you know forgotten about the water mm -hmm. so we'll see what happens with that <laughs> yeah see what, see what the river has to say the water says back to you <laughs> yeah so um in closing i just wanted to um I'll let everyone know that you're offering a free gift in the form of um, a free audio drumming story called Singing Stone uh, when uh, people sign up for a newsletter. And I will include all that information at the bottom of this uh, recording. So uh, do you want to say a little bit about that? Um, it's it's a uh, it's a, me telling a story using the drum. And um, it's a story that I originally heard from uh one of my teachers Stephen foster and and meredith little at school of lost borders about i don't know 25 30 years ago um and always i got the bare bones of the story like maybe 10 lines mm -hmm. and then as a storyteller i've quite embellished the story but stuck true to the plot <laughs> so it's a beautiful story of the initiatory journey and um and, and how that, you know, how the, the thing we are most searching for is not far. Mm -hmm. And is also searching for us. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for being a part of uh, tuning to the voice of Mother Earth Sound. And I just want to let you know, it's been truly just heartwarming to speak to you. Thank you so, so much for being with us. You're quite welcome. And I also want to offer uh, gratitude to all those ones we called in from yeah. the east and from the south and from the west and the north, the great above and the great below, the lands of our ancestors and the spirits of the lands around us and the great council. And thank you for being with us and giving us some adequate words to say today. Thank you so much. <laughs>